Uh, we're only about 12 days away from the 1st of July. Um, and on the 1st of July, 1916, the Battle of the Somme commenced. So I'll just give, give you a small run through for those who haven't been there. Those who have been there obviously know a good bit about it. But anyway, we'll have a run through and hope you, hope you enjoyed it. So we'll start at the, the, um, the Somme, the northern part of the Somme is in the Paddy Calais area and the rest of it is in the Somme or Picardy. So we'll start up at Goncourt, uh, excuse the French by the way, it's uh, for any French aficionados amongst you, um, my French is awful. So we'll start at Goncourt in the north and work our way down to Mame Montauban down here in the south where the French took over down here. So we'll start at Funk Vieux or Funky Villas, as the troops used to call them. Um, if they couldn't pronounce the French names, they gave them their own names. And Funky Villas sounds quite good to me. So every time I go to the Somme, I always go make a point to go to the cemetery because in here is the grave of Private Palmer. And his parents obviously could not afford to visit him, his grave. So they elected to have the following inscription. Well, some kind hand in a foreign land place a flower on my son's grave. And I always make a point <clears throat> of going there and doing the same. So we'll move from there towards Goncourt. And in Goncourt Cemetery is the unfortunate Private E. Whitlock, who when the, <clears throat> when the British took over the trenches from the French in 1915, he was unfortunately the first soldier to be killed on the Somme. And then we'll head from Gomkur, or sorry, be between Gomkur and our next stop is a demarcation stone. Now these were set up by the Belgian and French touring clubs to mark the limits of the German advance in 1918. It was intended that each of these stones were surmounted by a carved helmet of whichever army held the Germans in that sector. The Belgians followed the rule, so up at Ypres you'll see British helmets or French or Belgian helmets, but in France the French didn't adhere to it, and you'll find French Poilu helmets on all the demarcation stones, or those that have survived. This one has seen better days. It's been hit by a, a car, obviously a Frenchman with too much wine in them, and it's damaged. So <clears throat> moving from there, we go to Serre. And now Serre was the scene of um, great tragedy where the Pals were annihilated. This is Sheffield Memorial Park at Serre. And the <clears throat> Accrington Pals left from here, as did the Barnsley Pals, the Leeds Pals, all along this front and attacked the German positions at Serre. This is the, the trench that they jumped off from, running right along the, the front here. This is no man's land, out to the right. Now, there used to be four copses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Copse. Matthew Copse no longer exists, so it'll be ploughed over. Um, Mark, Luke, and John are now just one continuous tree line. But this is the trench that they, they jumped off from. And on this aerial photograph taken on the day of the actual 1st of July attack, there's Matthew Copps, which is no longer there, Mark, Luke, and John Copps. This is the British British lines. This is no man's land. And this is the German lines. So they attacked the trench line you saw in the previous photograph was approximately here. Now, I'm standing in no man's land, looking back towards... Mark, Luke, and John was further along here. Matthew is over here, which is no longer, no, no longer there. So this is no man's land looking back at where these pals climbed out of their trenches and attacked the German positions at Serre. Very few, if any, actually made it into the German lines, and those that did were never seen or heard of again. <clears throat> There's three cemeteries there. Two of them are in no man's land here. There's another one over to the left. If you haven't been to the Somme and if you ever get a chance to go, this is one place to uh, definitely go to because it's 
a very poignant place. We now move up to um, Beaumont Hamel. This is a sunken lane at Beaumont Hamel, where the 1st Battalion Lancashire Fusiliers attacked from. A cinematographer called, Mar uh, called Malins, he, he, <clears throat> he took his tripod camera and he stood up here at the top of the lane and he filmed the soldiers who were all sat down here and here they are. This guy's face always haunts me, but uh, this is them getting ready for the attack. Uh, the trench to the left, the embankment to the left where the soldiers are sitting is where they crossed over. The embankment to the right is where the Royal Engineers dug tunnels so the troops could get through from the British lines into this lane. Now this lane at that time was in no man's land. Now they actually got somebody who could lip read and in one section, <clears throat> which I'll show you in a minute, the um, the guy actually says to the guy he's talking to, I hope we're in the right place this time. So they've obviously practiced or something. There he's there, this guy's sitting here. He's talking to his pal, he says, I hope we're in the right place this time. 45 minutes after this film was, uh, footage was shot and these guys attacked, there were most of them, 90% of them were dead. Now, the area commander in this sector was a, a guy called Hunter Weston. Now, he demanded that uh, one of the mines that were placed in the area was set was set off 10 minutes before the actual attack. The attack was supposed to be at 7.30. He wanted the mine to go off at 7.20. He finally browbeat Haig into allowing him to do so. <laughs> so this is the lane that the soldiers were sat on. This is the Beaumont Hamel Road from Ocean Villiers, or Ocean Villas as the troops called it. And this is the embankment that the engineers dug the tunnels so the troops could get in. So this lane was actually in no man's land at the time. So at 7.20 instead of 7.30, the mine was set off according to Hunter Weston's wishes. So that's the mine going up under the German trenches. Unfortunately, because it went up 10 minutes early, it gave everybody else on the whole 17 mile front almost time to get ready for the attack they knew was coming because the, the German lines had been bombarded for over a week by the British artillery. What they didn't know was that the Germans were in 40 foot deep bunkers. So whenever they'd finished, they all come rushing up and the end result was inevitable. This is a clip of the mine. This is the embankment on the Beaumont Hamel Road. And with the benefit of a telephoto lens, I think I found Malin's position where he filmed it. And this mine crater is up here. There's the embankment on the road. It's an aerial photograph of the trench. And this taken after the 1st of July attack because it, on this photograph, the sunken lane is actually on the British line, on the British front line. So this is the sunken lane where they attacked from the first Lancashire Fusiliers. They came over this embankment into this field to attack this German position here and never made it any further than here. There's the mine, the crater that the mine set off up here. And this is the cemetery where they all lie. The moment Hamel Cemetery. The day we were there, it, was, it snowed quite heavily the day before. So there's a sunken lane. Down there is a sunken lane. Those troops came up over this embankment, across this field, to attack the German positions over, over this end. And none of them made it past here. This is some of the stuff that still lies about on the Western Front. A British Mills hand grenade, a French hand grenade, a British 303 live round, a very heavy calibre artillery shell. The French farmers tend to treat these with disrespect and they just grab them, put them to the side of the road ready for the French ordnance disposal guys to pick up. Now they tend to take the, the ones that don't have a live head on like this one, 
they tend to take the copper driving bands off. Now you see these two have the driving bands missing, collecting the copper. This one, the big one, they've left well alone because the driving band's still on it. This one up here is called a toffee apple or a plum pudding. It was a trench mortar. At the end of it would be a long stick, which was put into the firing tube and fired into the German trenches. So we move now from Beaumont Hamel, just over the ridge slightly to Newfoundland Memorial Park. This park was bought by the Canadian government to commemorate the Newfoundlanders who died here with the caribou. Oh, what happened there? Right. These are the German trenches at the far end of the park. This is the danger tree, which is in, it was in no man's land at the time. This is as far as the Newfoundlanders got. 726 of them were killed in an attack that shouldn't have gone ahead. But the word didn't get, get to them in time. A bit like that film 1917. They were not supposed to have attacked, but the message didn't get through. And they did attack and got wiped out. This is a replica tree that was put here. These flags are all the Newfoundland flag. Secret place for the Canadians. This is a memorial to the 51st Highland Division. It was modelled by, or the model used was Company Sergeant Major Bob Brown, DCM, MBE, Croydigare, Belgium. He was Company Sergeant Major of B Company, Glasgow Highlander, or the 9th HLI, who fought at Highwood. The cross in the foreground used to be at Highwood, and it was uh, dedicated to the first 51st Highland Division, but they brought it here when they made this permanent memorial. Where the two lions are, the original memorial had two cannons that they said when the Germans were here in the Second World War, they removed the cannons. This is Y Ravine, where most of these jocks from the November 1916 attack, when they finally captured all this area and Beaumont Hamel, are lying in this cemetery along with a lot of Newfoundlanders. So, this is an aerial photograph from Google. Up here is y, what they call the Y Trench. If you look, you can see the trench here with the, the branch spur coming up like that, like a Y. So these are all the German trenches, German frontline trenches. This trench here was dug prior to the November attack, was dug by engineers so the troops had less distance to cover to attack the Germans here. So this is well preserved. You see all the shell craters, all these holes are all shell, shell, shell marks. And there's the Caribou Memorial down here. So moving from Newfoundland Memorial Park, we go down the valley into the Onk. And in this cemetery, the majority of the headstones are all sailors because on the 13th, 14th of November, 1916, the Royal Naval Division fought along this valley and captured Bekur, Bakur, um, and that was one of the last actions of the Somme battles. The Somme actually lasted from July until November, 1916. So moving up the valley now, we've come to Teepval. This is the a replica of Helen's Tower, uh, which is at Clan Boyne near Belfast. Uh, it's called the, the Ulster Tower, it's called. Uh, it's built on the old part of the old German front line. <clears throat> What's inside the tower? You can actually go to the top of the tower and get a good view. Nice painting here of the 36th Ulster Division attacking the Schwaben Redoubt. Four VCs were one in that action. One of the most poignant one is Rifleman Billy McFadden. He was in the front line trench along with his comrades. The trench was full of troops. They were priming hand grenades like the one you saw earlier. Something happened. Nobody knows quite whether it was a shell explosion on the parapet. But the box fell. Two grenades fell out. The pins fell out. And Billy McFadden threw himself on top of the grenades. Um, 
what was left of him was picked up and buried, but they couldn't find it, obviously, after the war, so his name is on the Tietval Memorial. This was the high ground that the Germans have held, and there's the Newfoundland Memorial Park over here, and you can still see the Onk Valley is down here, and you can still see the remnants of the German trench line in the soil. Because it was so chalky down there, every year you can actually still see them. This is Connaught Cemetery, where most of the 36 Ulster Division troops were lot lie. Um, they actually managed to enter the Swaburn Redoubt, which is here. In the distance, you can see the Teepval Memorial. They actually managed to penetrate it, but because the attacking battalion on their right, because the, the, the Ulsters attacked from this direction up this way, and because the battalion on their right didn't um, manage to gain their objectives, the troops from the 36 Ulster Division who got into the Swaven Redoubt couldn't hold it, and the Germans counterattacked and drove them drove them out. This is Mill Road Cemetery, just near the Schwaben Redoubt, and the early burials, because they were buried on top of the old German front lines, were very unstable. So they had to put the, the headstones, had to lay them flat. The headstones you see on the left and on the right are on more solid ground, um, and these were brought in from um, other parts of the battlefield. But these were the original Ulster guys lying here. So if you look at this aerial photograph, there's the Ulster Tower. There's Mill Road Cemetery. You can actually see the German line where the cemetery is, where the tombs where the headstones are. This is the Schwaben Redoubt. And this is Tietval under British artillery bombardment. I only put, put this one on to show you the black lines. These black lines that you see here are barbed wire. These are, this is German barbed wire. So it gives you an idea of what the troops had to attack, what they faced, just trying to get into the German. This is the German front line trench here. The German second line trench, German third line trench, and all these are communications trenches. So to get reinforcements from the back areas, they had to use communications trenches. So this artillery bombardment seems to be concentrating on the con uh, communications trenches to stop reinforcements coming to the front line. <coughs> this is the Tietval Memorial to the Missing. There are 73,357 names on this memorial of um, soldiers who were bodies were never found between, this is between 1915 and the German withdrawal to the Hindenburg line in 1917. So 73,357 names are on this memorial. At the back of the memorial is the only cemetery with, where you'll find French and British graves or Commonwealth graves. 300 French, 300 Commonwealth graves at the back of the cemetery. So we move from Tietval, down the valley to OVA, and in OVA Cemetery is Captain Lauder, the son of Harry Lauder. Um, it was said that Harry Lauder wrote, keep right on till the end of the road when he heard of his son's death. So just a, along from La Boisselle, there from OVA is La Boisselle. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it, but most of the trenches are named I've got Scottish names like Anstruther Trench, Kirkcaldy Trench, Dunfermline Trench. These names, the, the troops who occupied these trenches gave them the names of the places they came from. Uh, in this case, in 1915, when the British took over from the French, it was um, Scottish regiments who were here, who, who manned these trenches. So they gave all the trenches Scottish names, Loch Nagar Street, Dundee Avenue, Athol Street, at this area, this area here was called the Glory Hole, where French engineers in 1914-15, then British engineers from then on, dug tunnels under each other's trenches and, and blew mines up. So there's all these little red thingies are all mines. Now bear in mind, if you look at the distance between the British front line and the German front line here, the distance is only 50 yards in that bit there. So... 
this cross is the Heidenkopf position and they set up a, a mine underneath there. There's the mine, the Loch Nagar crater. 26 tonnes of explosive were put underneath that German trench. You can see the German trench lines in the chalk still to this day. This was Marsh, Marsh Valley and this was Sausage Valley. British lines were up here. So Loch Nagar was bought um, by an Englishman, I forget which name is, Dunning I think his name is, because he saw the land being f gradually filled in, the, the bomb craters filled in, the mine shell craters filled in, and he bought it from the French to preserve it, um, and just as well he did. This was the, the, the size of the crater that was left. Obviously, time has worn a bit of erosion and stuff. Um, and that's from the other lip of the crater. The crater, when you, if you actually go there, the crater is actually huge. This is a photograph of the Northumberland um, Irish, or the Tyneside, the Tyneside Irish. Prior to their, atta their attack, the Tyneside Scottish had attacked um, and were totally decimated. This is the Tyneside Irish going now to support, and most of them would be killed as well. If you look, they're all carrying their rifles at the high port on their left shoulders, like it was a picnic or a day out. In 1998, on the lip of the crater, a tourist saw a boot sticking out of the chalk soil and, and it turned out to be one of the <clears throat> Tyneside Scottish, George Nugent. So he was buried in the same cemetery as um, Harry Lauder's son. And this is his grave, you see how relatively new it is. Lost, found, but never forgotten. May he rest in eternal peace. So moving slightly down from La Boiselle, we come to Contol Maison. And <clears throat> here they put a, a cairn to the McRae's Battalion, 16th Royal Scots, or the Heart of, Heart of Midlothian Battalion. In honoured memory of the players, ticket holders and supporters of Heart of Midlothian Football Club, who took part in the advance on Kuntal Maison on 1st of July 1916. Come pack up your footballs and scarves of maroon, leave all your sweethearts and all Ricky Toon. Fall in with the lads for they're off and away to take on the bold hun with old Geordie McRae. So down from Kuntal Maison, we come to Fricourt, only one of two German cemeteries on the Somme. This one has 17,020 German soldiers in it. Each of the graves in this cemetery has four burials, two and either, with a name, two names either side of the cross. At the back where the stone is, is the mass grave. Out here there's only 5,000. At the back there's the mass grave with the other 12,000. Where this guy is standing was where Baron von Richthofen was first interred after he was shot down further down the line, the other side of Albert. He was interred here. There he is. He was interred here and in 1923, I believe, his brother had his body removed and brought back to Germany, to his birth town in Germany. I thought this one was quite um, ironic, bearing what happened in the Second World War. He was a Jewish, a Jewish German soldier alongside a German soldier. So moving down from Fricourt, we come towards Mame. Now down here you'll see Mansell Cops. And from Mansell Cop, the Devonshire Regiment attacked Mummy. Now, Captain Martin from the 9th Devons made a plasticine copy with, uh, when he was on leave. And he had a, a premonition that if the artillery, the German, uh, British artillery, did not take out this machine gun post that was at, in, in the cemetery down here in the corner, his, his uh, platoon or his men would be wiped out. And this is the a picture of 
the attack by the, this is the Gordons attacking towards Mami up here. And this is Devonshire Cemetery. This is the trench that the 9th Devonshire's attacked from. This is Mansell Cop, Cops just at the back. And there's Captain Martin, whose premonition unfortunately came true because the German machine gun in that cemetery was not taken out and his, his entire uh, platoon or the, was taken out. Amongst one of them was Noel Hodgson, one of the war poets. And just as you go up to the cemetery is this, the Devonshires held this trench, the Devonshires hold it still. So 1st of July 1916, the 8th and 9th Devons suffered very heavy casualties as they left their forward trench to attack. Later that day, the survivors buried their fallen comrades in the same trench, they erected a wooden memorial with the words which were carved in the cross above. This is the Gordon Cemetery. They attacked along this valley here, from right to left, heading towards Mami. They're all buried in a semicircle. Well, in actual fact, it's, it's actually a, a one big shell hole. It's a, really a mass burial, but they've all got individual headstones. And the six officers were buried here. So if you look at the aerial photograph, this, there's the Gordon Cemetery down here. This is the line that they attacked towards Mame. This is Mansell Cops. I've been in that uh, copse and there's quite a high embankment. So when the troops came out of the copse and started to attack, the machine gun post that was on that map that was in the cemetery here was still here and their line of fire decimated them as they came in. Mame was one of the few successes of that day when it was, the village was actually captured by the troops attacking from this direction over here. So we come to the woods. Now, this is Mame Wood, this is High Wood, and this is Delville or De Devil's Wood. So we'll concentrate on Mame Wood first. This is the woods under bombardment. If you look at the trees, they're all well splintered with shells. They would be even further decimated. This is a holy place for the Welsh. This is where the Welsh 38th Division, or 34th, 38th, I think it was, um, attacked and took. There's um, memorials all over this wood from the, from the Welsh. Sacred place like Newfoundland is to the Cant Canadians, uh, Mammae Wood is to the Welsh. This was uh, one that was left, which I thought was quite poignant, to Alfred Priestley, a private of B Company, 16th Battalion Royal Welch Fusiliers, killed in action, Mammae Wood, Tuesday the 7th of July. Although we never knew you, we only wish we had. But we came here to be near you. We hope you will be glad. We don't know just where you're resting. We do know you're quite near. So we hope you'll understand why we left your puppies here. So the wood is actually full of tributes to the soldiers. This is their memorial, the Welsh dragon. Clutching the barbed wire. So there's part of Mammy Wood here. This is Flat Iron Corpse Cemetery, unique in that it has three sets of brothers in it. The Hardwoods brothers, both killed on the 11th of July. The Trigascus brothers, both killed on the 7th of July. And the Philby brothers, both killed on the 21st of July. If you look at their pay numbers, they, died, they enlisted on the same day, 5290, 5291, enlisted on the same day and died on the same day. <clears throat> Next wood we come to is Highwood. Now this is Highwood, this is like a lunar landscape, but Highwood is here in this corner. And this is Highwood now. You can't go into this wood, it's private land, the, the owners live here. There are memorials to the Scottish divisions that attacked it, it was finally captured by uh, the 47th London Division. So this is a cairn made from another, the stones were brought from another high wood near Culloden um, and it's topped off by a Glasgow kerbstone. 
And this was five foot seven, which was the minimum height for an HLI for anyone wanting to join the HLI. Another memorial to the Cameron Highlanders, who also lost heavily here, and to the London Division, who finally captured it. Next we come to is Delville Wood, or as the French, uh, the British soldiers called it, Devil's Wood. This was a scene of utter carnage. The South Africans fought here with, uh, they joined the 9th Scottish Division and fought here and lost very heavily. And you can see they called it Devil's Trench. Now, like Newfoundland Memorial Park that the Canadians bought, the South Africans bought Delville or Devil's Wood. So this is a South African memorial to them, and they have a museum at the top end here. Only one tree survived in the whole of the woods after the battles. This horn beam, the only surviving original tree of the battles of 1916. Rides, the rides that go through the woods were all given names by the Scots. Socky Hall Street, Princess Street, and a couple of others, I think, were actually Regent Street and Bone Street, but these are the Scottish ones. There's a, some guys from the Cavern Highlanders coming back from the battle at Longueval, which is just beside Devil Wood. Wee guy here getting his feet, feet stuck in the mud. A memorial to the Scottish Division, the 9th Scottish Division who fought here at Longueval. And just along from Longueval is Guimont. And the only reason I put this one in because it, nobody was actually spared. This is the son of the Prime Minister who is buried at Guimont. So moving down towards the, where the French took over, we come to Carnoy Cemetery. And here is Billy Neville, who um, gave each of his platoons a football. And at 7.30, when the whistles went, each of his platoons kicked a football as far as they could into no man's land. And the platoons went in after the, the footballs. Billy Neville, unfortunately, was one of the ones that didn't survive the 1st of July. Some more de uh, detritus, a British shrapnel, shell, another British shell, a British grenade, you can still see the ring that you would pull to pull the pin out, and a French grenade. And finally we come to Albert, which is where I normally stay when I go out there. This is the Notre Dame um, Cathedral. The French engineers, there's a, the Golden Madonna and Child at the top, French engineers propped it up with wires um, because it was superstitious that if that fell, whoever, whoever made it fall would, uh, would lose the war. Um, it did eventually go because these sort of towers were really great for forward observation, artillery observation officers. So it was actually, in 1918, it, it finally fell, but then the Germans by this time were um, almost defeated. And then it's rebuilt. What's the background to the PALS brigades? Basically, the PALS were formed um, when Kitchener, everyone remembers Kitchener with the, with the finger pointing, your country needs you. Um, by this time, you know, a lot of, um, there was a lot of unemployment. The uh, young lads felt, you know, it would be over by Christmas and they wanted to get, you know, they'd never been abroad. So they all joined on March, basically, because your friend was going, then I'm going. So we all joined as PALS, and um, these regiments were actually PALS battalions. It wasn't until after the Somme, um, when places like Accrington and Salford and Sheffield and Bradford um, lost so many young men that they totally scrapped the whole idea of men from the same places joining en masse. But basically that was, that was it. It was just guys that wanted to get away and then join up yeah. together you know, go out there before it was all over sort of thing. It was interesting, the Jewish headstone, because when we were, were in Ypres, we were told that when the Germans got to Ypres in the Second World War, 
Hitler gave instructions that none of the Jewish headstones should be damaged because of his feeling of having been, uh, well, he was in the each salient. Uh, so, you know, there obviously were feelings, even by Hitler. The song wasn't a great success, is, is that correct? Yes, it was an absolute failure. Apart from uh, a couple of small areas, uh, Freecourt was a success, Mame was a success. That was right down the southern sector, just before the French. The French actually had a more success as well, down that southern sector. The north, up at Goncourt, uh, Goncourt was, believe it or not, a, div a diversion. Um, the troops weren't told, uh, nobody was told up there, that it was a diversionary attack. Um, to bring troops, German troops, from where the main area was going to be down at um, Beaumont, Hamel, uh, Labois, and that area, and Freecourt down there. So they actually sacrificed an awful lot of the London guys uh, up at Con Goncourt. Yeah, I just wonder how many times you've barred back and forward to get this information. How many times have you been out there? Yes. Oh. I've been going out there since 1980. I've been going out there since 1989. I used to go out twice a year. Um, I tend to go out when there's not very many tourists out there. So I tend to go um, sort of March or October when when all the tourism's gone. That was a wonderful uh, discussion, Joe, and a wonderful trip down memory lane for me. Uh, not that I was in the First World War, but <laughs> uh, I've, been going to, I've been taking trips there since the 1970s. Do you find it now over commercialized? Yes. The poppy cat. The days when in Ypres, for example, you could wander around the cloth hall museum and pick up the objects and have a look at them. Now without, it's all a bit too touristy, in my opinion. Without a doubt, without an absolute doubt. Um, Teepval, when I first went to Teepval, it was just a memorial and you had the whole place to yourself. Now there's a whole big um, visitor centre there. Uh, they cater for busloads, by the busload. And it's like you see, it's very, very commercialised. They sell an awful lot of stuff there. Um, all right, you know, each to their own opinion, but for me, it's, it detracts from um, the battlefield itself. The last time I was at Tietval, they were selling replica headstones. Yeah. I, I complained that they've, they've now... Yeah. I, they've now removed them, but yeah. that was verging on the tatty. Recognitions I saw, we, had, uh, we were on a cruise and we ended up in St. John's, Newfoundland. And I uh, <coughs> my wife, I wonder how much Mel is still thought about in Newfoundland. And just at that moment, I turned around and looked at the harbour and saw a tug leaving the port. What was it called? Oh, Amel. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then later that day, it's a massive great bronze statue. I mean, I think Beaumont Hamel is really, it is. really imprinted into the memories of everybody in Newfoundland. It was just such a disaster. Yeah. What, what made you feel that you wanted to go there so often? Why there as opposed to some other things? Yeah. Well, it's a good question. Uh, it, for me, it started way back in eight, 1982 when I joined a book club. And the introductory books were like, you know, you joined the club and you got a book for 50p or something. So I bought two books. I mean, up until then, I, I knew about the First World War, but I, I didn't know anything about it. I just heard about it because Vietnam was my era and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I, I got these two books, both by Lynn MacDonald. Uh, one was just called Somme and the other one was called, they called it Passion Day. Um, and I, I started to read these books. I thought, no, you're joking. How can, how can you... How can you lose 50,000 men in one day? Uh, and it just went on from there. And I just, just kept going. I, I thought, I must go there and see what it was all about. And luckily, in the, in the 80s, like you say, it wasn't commercialised. Um, and you could wander about anywhere you wanted. And it was, it was absolutely brilliant. And we went, I used to go, we used to go in groups of three or, you know, three or four of us. Uh, and I would use, um, I would use Martin Middlebrook guide this, this is a, this is my bible um and we'd go out there with a specific plan of what we wanted to see and what we wanted to do and from there a, a subcontracted so to speak so I, I did all the vcs that are on the song but all their graves photographed i did i'm now doing i've now done shot at dawns 
the, the whole thing just, for me, just spiraled out, out of control, really. Um, I found this, it, just at the back of Newfoundland Memorial Park, and that's the nose coat of a German shell. So, and it's very heavy. Yeah. Germans in the Second World War removed two cannon. Yeah. Now, what, what sort of development between the First World War and the Second World War happened with the graveyard? Because it's a huge development now. Yeah. But how basically, many memorials were there between the wars? Uh, basically, the memorials really kicked off in the, from the 1920s. Uh, that, the Kilted Highlander wasn't put up till about 1923 or something. Right. Um, the Kilted Highlander has an interesting story, according to Martin Middleton. Uh, during the Second World War, the Germans actually wanted to bring the, because it's bronze, the Germans wanted it uh, demolished and brought down, so they hired a French guy to put scaffolding around it and demolish it or bring it down. Um, apparently the French resistance got to know about it and they got contacted London and then they kept they kept sending like spitfires or whatever across to buzz this guy trying to demolish the memorial and it never happened. He basically just said if you want to demolish it you go up and took all the scaffolding down but so the, the Germans took the two cannons from the base and took them away instead. 